Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with grateful hearts, Hallelujah. Now we're continuing our study in the book of Romans, and today we are halfway through chapter 2. Now we're going to pick up in verse 17, but what we need to understand here that Paul is speaking to Jewish people, Jewish people by bloodline, by being a descendant of Abraham, and they think because of this that they are special unto God, and it really isn't important how they live because their bloodline is what saves them. Their bloodline is what establishes them before God. This is what they think. And Paul's trying to lay out a defense, an argument, proving that God is not interested in one's bloodline, but God is interested in one's obedience. God is interested in one's surrender. Surrender to his rule, his law, and his way. And so Paul picks up in verse 17 and he says, Behold, you are called a Jew. And you rest in the law. You make your boast of God. Now notice how he says you rest in the law. You take comfort in the fact that you are a Jew. You are from the bloodline of Abraham. You make your boast that that makes you special unto God. You boast about knowing his will in verse 18. And approving the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law. What is more excellent you are confident that you yourself are a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. In other words, you think better of yourself than the Gentile. You think because you are from the bloodline of Abraham that you have some special knowledge that you are the answer for the world. You've made yourself an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes. You have a form of knowledge and of truth in the law, but here is where you have gone wrong in verse 21. You that teach others, do you not teach yourself? You act like the law is for everyone but you. You act like everyone else has to work so diligently to find approval with God, but because you are his special people, you don't have to do anything. You can rest instead of work. Because somehow God accepts you regardless of how you live. Doesn't this sound a lot like those who consider themselves Christians today? That because they take the name of Christ, somehow they're special. And all their sin, all their acts of disobedience are just somehow going to be overlooked because of this thing called grace. What a misrepresentation of truth, both for the Jewish people then and for those who call themselves Christians today. Because they're only Christians in belief, not in practice. But James 2.19 says the devils believe, yet they do not practice. So you are aligning yourself with the devil and the demons of hell. And the only way to separate yourself from them would to be surrender to the will of God and become obedient to the things that are important to him. And so Paul says again in verse 21, you that teach others... Are you not teaching yourself? You tell others not to steal. Well, why do you steal? You tell others not to commit adultery. But do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, are you not committing sacrilege? You abstain from the obvious things that violate the principles of God. But you're forgetting mercy and compassion unto those who are so undeserving of it in your minds in your eyes. You don't love the Gentile. You don't love the pagan as you do your fellow Jew. And yet God has said, love your neighbor as yourself. You boast of knowing the law, but in breaking the law, you dishonor God. And because of the way you live, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. In other words, why would the Gentiles want to serve your God when you yourself don't serve your God. Your example is poor and weak, and it's not a light unto them. For as it is written, circumcision verily profiteth, or truly profiteth, if you keep the law. So being from the bloodline of Abraham, 
as you follow the law of circumcision, which every Jew is to do, you act as if that's the only law that is important, but you have forgotten all the other laws, mainly the two greatest. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which means you're going to set out to obey everything that he says and love your neighbor as yourself. You're not going to pass by the beaten Samaritan on the side of the road just because he's a Samaritan, but you're going to love him as you yourself wanted to be loved if you were in that situation. And so your circumcision, your birthright, does profit if you keep the whole law. But if you be a breaker of the law, your circumcision is made uncircumcision. By the very fact that you're disobedient to the law, to the commands of God, you show yourself to be a pagan. And the same is true today, friends. There are many who call themselves Christian in title, but when we look at their lives, we see that there's nothing about them that resonates with the presence of the Almighty. And so by the way they live their lives, they prove themselves to be pagan, to be heathens. Now he says in verse 26, if the uncircumcision or the Gentile, the pagan, keeps the righteousness of the law, is obedient unto the things of God, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? In other words, shall not God favor him as a pagan more than he does you who call yourself a Jew? For even though he's uncircumcised in the flesh, he's proven that he's been circumcised by God through the Spirit in his heart. He has become a new creation. And shall not uncircumcision or the, the pagan, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, shall he not judge thee, you the Jew, who by the letter and circumcision transgress the law? So you, a Jew, transgress and break the law. He, the pagan or Gentile, obeys the law. Who do you think finds favor in God's eyes? Do you think it's you simply because of your bloodline? Do you think it's you simply because you call yourself a Christian? Simply because you go to church? Simply because you read your Bible? Simply because you pray? Simply because you give to the poor? No, says Paul in verse 28. One is not a Jew which is one outwardly or by birthright from the bloodline of Abraham, neither is circumcision of the flesh, which is outward in the flesh. But one is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Now that should remind you of Ezekiel chapter 36, beginning in verse 25, when God says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you will be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh." I will circumcise your heart with a spiritual scalpel. And because of this, as we are told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, you who are in Christ, you are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Old things are passed away. That's what Peter means in his first letter in chapter 4, beginning at verse 3. He says, for time past of our lives, may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. In other words, there was a time where we lived like pagans. When we walked in lasciviousness or without restraint, when we followed the lusts of our hearts, when we spent our time in the excess of wine, drinking and parties, revelings and banquetings, and all abominable idolatries. But now, praise God, we are in Christ we are new creations. He has taken out the heart of stone and given us hearts of flesh. All things are gone. They're dead. They've passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's why when we get to Romans chapter 6, which is a victorious chapter, we're going to read in verse 7, he that is dead is freed from sin. And in verse 2, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? 
And in verse 4, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, in all the power of the resurrection that brought him forth from the grave, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And that's the message that Paul is trying to express to these Jews, specifically to these new Jewish believers. That obedience unto God and the things of God are not only expected, but they are required. And this demands a life of self-discipline, self-sacrifice, self-denial. And as much as we try to run from that message, friends, when we open the pages of scriptures, that's what the Bible is all about. Come out from among them. Be ye separate. Cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Oh, friends, the message that Paul is presenting to this church some 2,000 years ago, he's presenting to us today through the foreknowledge of the Holy Spirit. The message is the same. Nothing has changed. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Paul says one is not a Jew based upon a birthright, but one is a Jew based upon the new birth. And so if we are the people of God, let us live like the people of God. Let us show the world that there's something special about being different, about being committed, dedicated. Let us not be ashamed for the stand that we take against this world, but let us stand boldly, proudly, confidently, knowing that as we stand for Jesus through our obedience unto his word, we stand for truth and all that is right. Well, we're going to close there today, friends, and I trust that you've been blessed and challenged through this word, through this exhortation that we've received this morning. I know that I have. And one of the things that you're going to see through our continual process of studies, even through the books that we review, is that the message is the same. It's very repetitive. But we, as the people of God, living in such a dark and evil world, friends, we need these reminders. Well, now, may the Lord Jesus bless your walk today, and may you be a light to someone out there, someone in your sphere of influence. May you be a light unto them as they try to find their way out of the darkness. Now, as Yahweh wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.